Good started. Good morning. We have a lean class, I suppose. Uh, um, so uh, the DA sent an email about the homework project grading, right? So he graded it, and many of you seem to have run the experiments when the when somebody else also was running on your on your uh, <coughs> system on the EXP server for the homework project two, right? So the code looks fine, but it didn't scale past one or two because somebody else was also running. Um, and so I think for that he was he was running the code and then trying to give you credit. Some of you had cases where the, the speed up kept going past four, past five, and past six, which you can't do, right? Because there's no physical hardware to actually do that. So if you had submitted the code and then he looked at it to give you a grade, if you hadn't submitted the code, I think he assumed that you haven't done it. So if you have, you have the code, please talk to him afterwards. But I think he's gonna give the handouts to the, the secretaries right now. So you'll be able to pick it up in the afternoon, right? But in general, when you run experiments, if you depend on the machine timing, make sure that no one is logged in. And if you are, if, if somebody is, you know, just work it out, because you, you're not running for a long time, right? So make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes, right? If, there are, if, if three of you are running a, uh, the program at the same time, you're not going to see four times the speed up because you're, you're sharing the physical four processes, right? Make sense, right? So, continuing back with where we left off in last class, right? Is everyone comfortable with, with the, the whole thing we're talking about programs and memory and all those things, right? Those, those topics were not really from operating system, those are really from your programming side. And this is one of the one of the other cases where the operating system is the central component, right? You as a programmer writing some program which is being compiled, you know, changed something by the compiler, and that has to run on the hardware. And again, the operating system is in the middle, right? So one of the things we mentioned was when you write programs, your programs, when it gets compiled to a, a assembly language and, and, and stuff like that, how many of you know assembly language? or seen assembly language or heard of assembly language or few of you uh, in, in what course was it in a hardware kind of class or architecture, architecture? okay um, um, so for the rest of you assembly language is basically a, even a lower level C right so when you where you have while loops and for loops they basically pretty pretty much use sort of like a jump statement right um, so let's I want you to understand a little bit of how programs work because um, the memory, all the stuff we talked about memory management depends on some understanding of who's making the request, right? The, the book talks about memory requests coming from some abstract entity and that abstract entity is you as a programmer, right? So in assembly language, it, it's mostly like a EOC program, but it's it has jumps in. So of course, the syntax is different. So you can think of there is assignments like, you know, um, a, let's say it's a uh, memory location, you can you typically have something like this, where some contents of some register gets assigned to a um, memory address, right? And you may have something like jump to L1, where L1 is like this, right? This would be similar in your C context to be like something like A equals one and go to Even though we tell you not to use go to and C, right? Sort of you have something like this, right? So this is sort of how your your program gets translated from your C to something like assembly language, right? So when you write your program, when you have global variables, those you expect it to be modified. So those get the compiler would call them as a read um, read write memory. Any any constants like string constants will have to be assigned to read only memory and all those things. So you you so your program gets translated to the hello world program we saw. There's a little text segment where your assembly language program or your program will go, and then you have some read only segment and read write segment. Right? You put your global variables here. You put your global non modifiable variables here constants here, and then you also get a stack 
because that's what you need to write your global local variables and stuff, right? And one of the other things you noticed was you have a printf, right? Printf comes from a library, right? Because it's not part of your program, it comes from a C library. So you have to go through a process called linking, where you create a link for define printf in some library. You load the text for printf. Printf may happen to be somewhere here. And printf itself may need more read-write buffers, right? So when you do the linking, you, you kind of link, you locate where the library is, load the code into your program. So when you're running your program, you need your program and all the things it's linked, right? So now you have this, all these bubbles kind of floating around, right? So the linking process basically finds the link and creates a link like this. But when you're loading, when you're actually running on the machine, you can't have abstract things like pointers like this. You need exact addresses. So you would say, instead of calling printf, you would say call you know, 0x100 or something, <laughs> right? And if this was loaded at 100, this basically says, if you want to call printf, you're calling this exact address, right? So that's what we are talking about in, in terms of converting from your string notion of functions to the actual memory locations that you want to operate on, right? And one of the things we also introduced was the notion of a logical addresses and physical addresses. The idea here is if it's a logical address, your program, when you do this translation, can call it 0x100. And we as operating system are free to actually locate this in some other location. So if you say we can locate this at 1000, right? Whereas you as a program would call it as 100. In reality, it may be 1000, right? The reason why you would want to do that is because of cases like this. I'm going to sit, right? So when you write this program in assembly language, right? Suppose you have A assigned to R1, and then you say jump L1, right? So when you do the loading, right? Again, you can't have labels like this. You'll have to convert it to some address, right? So you have to convert it to, let's say, 0x100. And this happens to be 0x100, right? You typically call addresses by hex hexadecimal because it's easy to uh, see, right? If you didn't have the notion of logical addresses, and if you only had physical addresses, that means this address has to be here all the time. If you want to move it to a different address because you, you just want the, the flexibility, you have to go into your program you have to find all the cases where it's referring to address and rewrite them. For people who are taking hardware class, you can kind of see where, where, where that will go, right? So if you want to move this program, so suppose you replace this by, if this was a physical address, this is a physical address, if you wanted to move this segment from one address to another address, you have to go in and rewrite the program to something like this. Does that make sense? Because if your program was referring to some uh, some location where in a hard-coded fashion, you can't just move it unless you change the whole stuff, right? Having a notion of logical addresses really help you because your program can continue to call it as 0x100. You do the translation on the fly, and you need the memory management unit to make that happen. Yes? For everything that the assembly program refers to be held in like a single block so that the offset would be the same for everything? Uh, no. A different offset for every different That's block. an excellent question, right? So it, it's related to how many blocks do you need, right? How many blocks do you really want and how many blocks you, you need to have, right? So is there a reason why you would want to have a fewer number of blocks, right? <coughs> fewer number of blocks meaning all the, let's say in your program, Printf wanted some read write memory, and this is what happens, right? If you let's say you have int a, b, and c, right? In a, let's say this is a global variable, right? That means the compiler has to create some memory for it. So it can, it can, one case it can create three blocks, one for a, one for b, one for c, right? In another case, it can create one block and put a, b, and c, right? It's sort of related to what you, are, what you were asking, right? Thinking of the hardware side, is there a reason why you would choose one over the other? What's the benefit of having this? 
we haven't we haven't seen one of the the, the next couple of slides we'll see why you would want something like this right you would want something like this because you can have ways of figuring out if you're violating the segment right you can say if you access anything here or here I should be able to catch it with the hardware support. And we'll see that in a couple of slides, right? So if you have more of these, then you have the flexibility of more, doing more control if the hardware will let you do that, right? If you connect, collect everything into this one area, then if you illegally access these, you won't get any kind of fault, right? And this is exactly what you get for a segmentation fault. If you try to access anything outside your segment, right? So the, the question of how many segments should you have, right? The more segments you have, you have a lot more control over what, what should happen, what doesn't happen in your program. But all, that all needs the hardware support. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So again, here, we are completely dependent on the hardware, right? The, the better MMU you have, all this happens on the memory management unit, right? There's a separate hardware, the separate <laughs> chip which resides in most of the machines, it, it, it's a separate from your processor, main processor, but it could be built into the main processor, right? Essentially, you need some hardware support. You, as a programmer, doesn't, don't really care how many segments there are, because from your program perspective, all you want is a memory, right? Having more, more of these segments would, would let you have more control over bugs, but having more segments may not be possible because of your hardware, so you have to figure out what is a good point, right? How much do you want, right? But potentially you can have many segments, and, and, and typically you do because one of the things that we said for the printf, right? This printf is a dynamically linked library. Usually it's a dynamically linked library. In, in Windows you call it DLL, and in, in, uh, in um, Linux and stuff you call it shared library, right? What it means is this library could be shared by another process, right? So when you run lots of programs in your system, they all have one copy of the library shared amongst all of them. We'll see how you would do that. But essentially, you're sharing the same copy. That means you cannot just make it into one segment because then it'll go into one process, right? So you have all these segments. So when you run your program, you have your code, and then you have other shared libraries, which are segments which are shared among multiple processes. And they all, so you, you end up having a lot more segments than you may realize. But from, from your perspective, you don't actually notice a difference except in terms of performance, and that's what we'll see, right? So are, are these stuck, are the concepts sort of clear, right? So, so the main thing to remember is the, the, when we talk about memory management and stuff, the requests are coming from you as a programmer, and we would like, the operating system is trying to give you some services, and it, but it needs the hardware, because if you don't have the hardware, all these translations and all cannot be done, because like, like we mentioned, the logical address translation is so cost, you know, it's so expensive. You, you can't do this in software. It has to be done by the, by the hardware, right? And except for very simple uh, architectures, most of the machines will give you all this, uh, all this stuff, right? So if you're programming for your, say, cell phone or, or watch or something, they typically don't have memory management unit. They typically don't let you do all this translation. You have to have a simple way where your program can always run only one address. But in most modern architectures, you cannot, Imagine an operating system without a MMU, right? And that's sort of what I had. So you have like all these blocks, and so we're trying to figure out where these blocks go and, and how these things are managed, right? Whereas in the, the loading and uh, linking phase, you, you, you do those linkings, right? You can do it dynamically or, or, or statically. But from the from operating system perspective, all it looks like is you're asking for lots of chunks of memory and the, the translation, right? The translation which you don't know, but operating system will do, right? You as a program will only see logical addresses. You can never see physical address, right? That's one thing you can never see. As a program, you can never write a program which can look at the physical address because that's managed by the operating system, right? So, so I'm going to introduce some of the some of the technologies that uh, are going to be in our arsenal, right? So the first technology we, which is going to be in our arsenal is the notion of a logical address and physical address, right? And that's going to be a lifesaver because that's going to do, like, let us do a lot of the tricks because that means that you as a program can continue to imagine that you're running on the same address while I can move you wherever I want. You are looking at the logical address which is always constant, 
I'm going to look at physical address, which I can move around wherever I want to get more power, right? And, and we'll see what that power is later on. The other powerful technique I, I, I'm going to work on is called swapping, right? <coughs> swapping is the notion that if I, so IS operating system can decide that some memory segment that I gave you, I'm going to put them into the storage, into the hard disk, or I put them away somewhere, right? So that when, when you want it again, it's my duty to bring it back from the hard disk and put it back in the memory so your program can run, right? So the idea here is if I have to context switch you out of, out of there, so if you have a process and you're no longer going to run, then if I know that you have a page, you, if you have a memory that you're not using at this point, I can put you on the hard disk, I can put that memory in the hard disk, <coughs> move somebody else there, right? And let them do their, what they have to do. And then when they are done, and when you want your memory back, I move it back. I think the illustration is sort of here, right? So you have to have a, what is called a backing store, right? You have to have a backing store. So what you do is you move stuff from your memory onto <coughs> the storage, right? And, when, and, and give the memory to somebody else, right? So if you, if you had one gig of memory in your system and you're using one gig, so I can move all of you into the hard disk and bring some other application, give it the memory that you once held, let them run, and then move them back. This is called swapping in and out, right? And we can do this because we expect that both of you are not running at the same time. We can't do this if both of you are running at the same time, right? And, and, and we'll see, we can get pretty smart about what we move, right? We, we'll, we'll see how we can move this on demand and, and, and do in a much finer grain. But the idea here is, since I know you're not, you're not gonna run, I can move you off, right? And if the hardware gives me more control, I can actually figure out why, where you're going to go and make a more intelligent decision, right? So if I can tell the hardware that from your process, if you try to access a logical address 100, right? That address, even though you think it's valid from your site, from your program site, IS operating system did something such that that's no longer, there's no longer a translation for that in the physical memory, right? So in that case, you have to call me. So if the hardware can let me give that control, then I can do this on demand. We'll see that later on, right? So essentially what that means is this process of swapping in and out can happen uh, at, at a nice fashion that you don't notice the thing at all. So all these programs assume that they're getting all the memory they wanted, right? And the limitation is only how much backing store you have. The, the, the less you have, you're, you're, you're in trouble. But the more you have, you can, you can potentially run a whole lot of applications, right? So think of, of this concept what do you think is restriction on how, how far you can push this? What is the what is the what are the things which will decide how far you can push this, right? Meaning how many how many processors can you swap into the disk? Can you do infinite number of processors? a trick question, right? Infinity never happens on real systems, but let's say a large number, right? Can you can you do 10 of these up there? 20 of those up there? Yes? You could, but it would take a long time. Disk, disk accesses tend to be pretty slow. Yeah, so it all depends on how fast this thing is, right? So you are trying to move it over here because you assume that this is plentiful and cheap. Right? You would never do this if this was plentiful and cheap, plentiful, cheap, and fast, and this is slow, and this is, sorry. You, ex you ex expect this to be plentiful and cheap, and usually when things are plentiful and cheap, they are also tend to be slow, right? You would never do this if this happens to be more plentiful, more cheap, and more, uh, and, and, you know, and also faster, right? So you only do this because this happens to be cheap and slow. So to move something off to the hard disk, you have to pay the price of moving something on a slow basis, right? So like things can operate, let's say, at, at 1x speed here, 
um, sorry, 100x speed here, and this may happen only at 1x speed, right? So you don't want to move stuff all the time, right? So if I have 10 processes, and if I have to move them back and forth, and if it takes me, let's say, 100 times to 100 times the time to move stuff in and out, right? Soon you'll notice that you're spending all your time moving stuff back and forth, right? So you don't want to push it so far where all the work you're doing is essentially moving stuff back and forth, right? Many of you may have fa faced this. I mean, if you if you run, unless you have like gaps of memory, right? You will notice that if you start a new application, your disk will go crazy. I mean, depending on how, how noisy your disk is, your disk will start going crazy because it's, it's moving stuff in and out, right? And you can't do anything, you can't stop anything in the middle because it has to be brought back in before you can interact with it, right? You can't kill an application because it has to be brought back in so it can be killed, right? Because it can give control to you kind of stuff, right? So you want to find a balance and then we'll see how, so essentially all the, all the thing, thing is the, the technology is trivial. All, we, all we're doing is we find something which is cheap and plentiful, move something that you have onto the cheap and plentiful stuff and move somebody else and then swap them back out, right? And our limitation is how, how much, what's the overhead and how much benefit you get, right? If, it, if, if I'm doing it really right, you won't notice that I'm doing this at all, right? For the most part, I mean, all the, most of the machines does that. So right now, if you look at the, like in, on this machine, some of the other processes might have been swapped out, right? For example, if the operating system is doing a good job, you can decide that I'm, I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation, right? So it might have swapped out the IE Explorer, which is running on the background, because I'm not using it, right? So till I go back to it, I don't notice the difference. But for now, I'm pretty happy because the machine looks like I get all the memory and I'm, I'm making good progress, right? If you're doing a good job, you don't notice it. If you don't do a good job, you notice it. And you don't notice it really badly, and we'll see uh, what, what that is, right? So, so we, now we have technology where you can call an address. IS operating system can move it around to whatever I want. Now we have a technology where you think you have the memory. I can remove it and then give it back to you, right? And as long as you don't, you don't notice it, you can't complain. The only way you can complain is notice it is if the timing, right? If you say I want that memory, if it takes you like uh, one second to get it, that means it's probably in, in some uh, backup disk and it's being brought in, right? So you notice on the timing, but we make no guarantees on how soon a memory can be given to you. So with these two technologies, I can make, I can make, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I can do lots of tricks, right? So the, the next, the next issue that you have to face is now that you have all these, all these um, um, memory segments, right? So we, we saw that there's this text segment and read segment, whatever your program wants, a whole bunch of segments. How should they be allocated to you, right? Should they be allocated to you in a contiguous fashion or should they be given in whatever different fashion, right? And so contiguous fashion is all the segments, you know, the read, all the read write segments should follow each other. So if you look at from your program, if you look at the addresses of what was assigned to you, they look contiguous. They go from zero through however big your program is. If it is non-contiguous, then you can, you can choose to give it any which way you want, right? And the, the, the nice thing is, if you, depending on how you do it, many of the hardware gives you a facility to define two numbers, right? Let, let's say you are doing a contiguous allocation. It gives you a facility to have two numbers. One is the base and one is the limit, right? Those are essentially there to protect you from other, modifying other programs, right? The idea here is, let's look at this is the, 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 the the main uh, physical memory, right? So, sorry, the, the, ma the, main, the main logical memory. So I want to give you some address, right? So I want to give you address, um, for your process I want to give from 3004 to 42094, right? I have, to prevent, I have to do something to prevent you from modifying something that is not, that does not belong to you, right? If I don't, then you can access any memory uh, easily, right? Because in, in, in C, it's very easy, right? So if you say pointer equals 10, right? And then if you say star pointer, then if I don't do something, then if you can read it, then things can go bad, right? So what, what you get, what you typically expect from your hardware, which is, which, this is such a fundamental operation that most hardware provides it, most MMA provides it, <coughs> which is the notion of a base and a limit, right? So that says that 
these two are assigned to you. These are the two things that are done to you. So every time you make an access, a memory access, <coughs> I need to check to make sure that whatever you're accessing is between those two, right? So essentially, this is what you want to do, right? Your process creates an address, right? And now I have to check whether it is, bit, you know, it is above the base and below the base plus limit, right? If I can do this, then it doesn't quite matter how I do the, the contiguous or, or non-contiguous allocation. But this, this protects you from other people running on the same machine, right? So now the CPU, now, now the MMU does not only the tasks are converting from logical to physical address, it also checks to make sure that whatever you're asking is between certain limit, right? And now it depends on how, how powerful the hardware is, how many link, base and limit registers there are, decides how many segments you can have, right? If, if your hardware only allows you to have one base and limit register, then you probably want to have it all contiguous. If it gives you multiple base and register, then I can say, you know, the my read write segment will have its own base and limit. This one will have its own base and limit. This one will have its own base and limit. And I can, I can give you this memory to you, and you create whatever logical addresses, but you can't possibly go beyond that, right? So what will happen if you go beyond, the, so if there's a violation, right? What kind of a trap do you think it, this is? I'm sure most of you have seen that trap. Huh? Yeah, that's the seg fault, right? If you're going beyond that, that uh, if it is going beyond your segmentation, right? Because that is the only thing allocated to you, you get a seg fault, right? So, When you, okay. based on your notion of when you get sec falls, right? Does your typical program allocate memory like this or allocate it like this? Not random, not, not just random checks, but I'm saying three different segments. Do you think you get three different segments or do you get yeah. one chunk? I mean, again, depends on how your compiler does it, how your program does it, right? Do you get three different chunks or do you get <coughs> sort of one big chunk? Yes, one, one big chunk. I think you most likely get one big chunk, right? Because as long as you're modifying something, so you are, usually if you look at the addresses, right, they follow each other and you can modify whatever, right? Let's try this program, okay? So if you create int a, b, c, right? So if you do a print of Right. If, you, if you print the address, right, you'll notice that they're all kind of together, right? So if you do the address of A, you'll get the logical address that A was allocated, right? So you'll get some number. And if you do the allocation of B, you'll see it's, it's like next to each other, right? One other way to do that is if you say, um, Do you know what would happen if you have code like this? Can you see? So I'm doing address of A, right, plus one, whatever it's pointing <laughs> to, I'm changing it to, say, 10. Do you know what it should do in, uh, what, is, what it should do and what, should, what does it typically do, right? This is clearly a, like bizarre code, right? I mean, C would, like you probably were not taught how to code like this, right? If they did, you know, they should be shot, right? Because this is kind of bizarre code, right? But what do you think will happen if you do this? It'll change B, right? It'll, it'll change B because basically that's what, what 
typically you can't depend on this, right? I mean, nobody promised you that A has to follow, B has to follow C, but typically this is what happens, right? Um, and this is one of the things that you may not be taught, but you'll end up doing if you ever program in C. You'll tend to do these little hacks that may or may not work, right? Have you ever, so, so for people who use the uh, debugger, right? Have you ever wondered how you figure out how to print the stack trace? Right. If, you, if you use a debugger, it will tell you which program uh, application it came from, right? Can you, do you think you can, you can do a stack trace printing by yourself? It, it's, it's very easy. It's, the concept is very easy, but you probably have to hack a lot to kind of get it right, right? So what happens is when you, when you call a function, right? Again, again this, this, is, this is essentially how the, again, it's nothing related to operating system, but it's more related to how you understand what your program really does, right? So when you, when, you, when you call a function, right? Let's say you call function one and two, right? So what happens is the return address for this function in your stack, you'll push the return address, right? You'll typically push one, you'll push two, and you'll push the, I think the count of two, and then it'll allocate, let's say if you say in A, you'll allocate A here, right? So the way you do stack traces, you find, if you find the address of A, right? If you can do this, you'll find the address of A, right? So if you find the address of A, then if you do A minus minus, you get here. And then you eventually come to the address, then you use that to figure out where there is, and you can keep going, looking at all the stuff, right? So even though this is ugly code, even though you were probably never taught to think like that, once you begin to do interesting programs, right? This is one of the reasons why people like C, because it kind of lets you do all this stuff and to do all the stuff, you have to have understanding of how your program memory is being allocated and modified, because essentially that's, that's, that's the key here, right? This is not part of how C should operate, but you know that if you're using a stack, you know, the, when the memory allocation happens, all these things are allocated in the stack, so you kind of follow the stack to figure out where things are, and you proceed, right? So it is, this sort of both go in hand, hand in hand. So, um, Right. So it's kind of off tangent, but essentially that, that's the that what happens, right? So this technology allows us to define some uh, bounds on your system, and this depends on the memory management unit, right? So why do we depend on the memory management unit? Can we do this in, in software? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll, it'll be way too much overhead because every access will have to be checked, right? So if you do A equals B plus C, you have to see if B does, you know, go beyond the range, A, C goes beyond the range, A goes beyond the range, and you have to do the addition and subtraction, right? So now you appreciate, like, every instruction you do has to have this MMU doing checks on, on where you're accessing and doing some additions to make these things happen, right? So, so when you, when you um, take architecture course, does architecture course like go through MMUs as a separate? It does. It does, okay. Usually it's not very glamorous from the architecture perspective. I don't, I've never seen somebody very proud of saying, I invented a new MMU, because it's, it's, it's sort of what, what, you know, it does all the grunt work kind of stuff. But from an from operating system perspective, you don't have MMU, then I'm kind of stuck, right? Then I can, I can create something like your cell phone kind of stuff, but any serious operating system, I depend on the MMU to do all the stuff, right? And MMU tend to be fast because it has to do all the stuff as soon as possible because the slower it gets for each other's checking, the whole processor gets slowed down, right? So, so in terms of the allocation, when you, when you talk about the allocation, right, I can either think of contiguous allocation where when a new process wants a memory, 
I can keep, I guess operating system can tr keep track of empty memory and then put you inside, right? So this is, if I don't do a swap, if I don't do a swap, then if I know this chunk of memory is free and you ask for some memory, I can, I can allocate this to you. And once it's allocated, there's, there may be holes, right? It does not have to be contiguous. So this, even though I call it process, it could be different segments of your process, right? So essentially that's how I get non-contiguous uh, allocation. So then the question is, how do we do that? How do we go about doing that? So if I have something like a hole here, right? And you have another process coming and asking for it, right? How should I give the space, right? So in this case, it looks kind of easy because it, it looks from here, you go from here to here to here. There's only one choice, right? There's only one, one piece of the hole, right? But what happens is when you keep running this program, essentially the processes leave, right? So let's assume that at this point, process nine leaves the system, right? So now you have a empty slot here, and you have empty slot here. So when a new process comes and it wants memory, now you have a choice. You can either put the process here, or you can put the process here, right? Because you have two chunks of memory, right? So can you think of ways of how you would decide which of these holes to put in your um, memory? I want to do a contiguous allocation, so I want something contiguous, right? So think of this like this, right? So at this point, Let's say that all of these have been allocated, right? And now we have someone who wants this much of memory, right? How do you figure out which one to give it, right? Can you think of policies of uh, how you how you might do that? Yes. Give it the smallest one that will fit in, so that you can use the bigger one. Yeah, so you can find the, so you can go through the list of all the free ones, right? So you have to sort of keep track of all the free list, right? So you have to keep track of some sort of a data section which shows that from here to here of size certain amount is free, right? So you go through this list and the first one that Adam picked up was the, the one which leaves the smallest hole left, right? So you're trying to find, so if this was 100, and this happens to be um, 120, and this happens to be 110, right? 110 size. With the worst fit, I would fit it right here, right? And then now I would have a 10 left over, right? So let's call this worst fit, right? What's the <coughs> other way? It's all heuristic, there's no um, science behind it, right? What can you, where can you fit this? Let's just make this 400 just for, good, right? There has to be some policy which picks that, right? because that's only the alternative in this illustration, right? So in, in that sense, so you may decide to choose the biggest one, right? Because if you choose the biggest one, you're likely to leave a larger hole, right? So if you allocate it here, now you're going to create a 300 and your original of 110, right? The, the hope is if you do that, then Another process which is going to come is more likely to be satisfied, right? It's more likely that somebody is going to need 300 or 100 than somebody is going to need 10, which which is what would, would have happened with with what you had, right? Is that true? I just made up this policy, right? So, is it, does it have to be true? 
Now we are back about talking talking about operating systems, right? So everything I said before holds, right? Remember the magic answer which always holds for anything? Depends, right? So it, it depends on what, how the thing is happening. So you don't know what is going to happen in the future, right? So this will this will be a great idea if the future request came for say 300. It'll be a horrible idea if the future request was for 400, right? So if I went to the Adams model, then I would have given this to the current process. The next one would have gotten the 400. Everybody would have been happy, right? But if if it were, if it happened that the next one happened to be 400 in this model, I cannot I cannot give, right? So so the, these are these are different policies, and essentially the idea here is I can give you whatever size you want, and I'm trying to fit those, right? And So I, 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 I think the worst fit is what I suggested, and I think yours is the best fit, right? So you have the first fit, best fit, and, and worst fit. I think I, I, I call his one the worst fit. I think his one is the best fit. The worst fit is you find the one which has the, the worst amount of fit. The assumption is you'll get the most amount of space, right? But anyway, you, you use these different heuristics in trying to do the stuff, right? Why would you choose first fit? Well, you go through the list and you find the first fit and then put it in, right? It's the fastest, right? Remember everything that operating. Now we're going back to what we did in the in the module one, right? Everything that the operating system does is overhead, right? So since it's not clear which one is supposed to be optimal, first fit may have may turn out to be good because first fit it's faster, right? Because you have to go through this list to find these things. If the list is uh, has two items, it doesn't matter. But if the list is large then you don't want to do this searching all the time because it's not clear what is optimal, right? So you can think of best fit, first fit, um, and, and, and what have you. And so researchers go through and try to figure out what is a good model for allocation, right? So what do you need to figure out whether some, some kind of mechanism is good? What do you need, what, how would you go about showing that first fit is good, best fit is good, worst fit is good? If I ask, Adam to defend his choice, right? Why do you think best fit is going to be good? Suppose, suppose we hire you at, uh, let's suppose we're at Microsoft, and I hire you to be the operating system designer, and you say, well, I want to do best fit. How would you convince me that that's a good <coughs> choice? What are the steps you would take? Yes? Well, if we use best fit, then since the, the whole leftover will be smallest, then we can accompany a bigger new process. Mm -hmm. Then if we did worse fit, then the, mm -hmm. the largest block we'd have left would be smaller. Yeah, but that's a theory, right? But why why would I want to do it? I mean, those are the, that's a theory, right? I mean, if, if, if A happens, one policy is good. If B happens, one policy is good, <laughs> right? But why do I want to go with one or the other, right? So to do that, you need to convince me that typically people do A and not B, right? And that's how you have to argue with me, right? So you have to say, look, we are Microsoft, right? Our customers run PowerPoint and Word, right? They run PowerPoint, Word, and Photoshop, right? We don't care about Photoshop, right? You care about PowerPoint and Word, right? So if PowerPoint and Word users are going to be happy, we have to analyze what PowerPoint does, right? So we have to see what, if you run a PowerPoint program, you want to see how they request memory, where they go, and I want to use that to drive my policy. So I, I can show you, I can run a simulator, I can run some program to show you that if you use PowerPoint, PowerPoint typically asks memory in, in this kind of a fashion, right? So if I run a typical PowerPoint session, and if I analyze the system using simulator or what have you, I can show you that if I do best fit, I'll get certain number of memory which can be allocated, worst fit which can be certain number of allocated kind of thing, right? So you want to analyze what your program is, you want to see how they make the memory request, and you want to come up with a policy, right? And in general, there are some you know, hypotheses. People have looked at different kind of systems, and it turns out that certain policies tend to be good and certain don't tend to be good. But you want to run these things, right? And that's what you, you go about doing the stuff, right? So in fact, that's what we're doing for homework project three, right? 
Homework project three, how many of you looked at the homework project three? So, so few of you, right? So essentially what, what you do is there's a tool called PIN, which essentially you can run it on Mac or Linux or Windows, right? And we are gonna look at, on, at the Itanium. Right, and then this is one of the homework projects where you're free to run it on your own PC if you know, if you know how to install a PIN, which is not that hard, right? Essentially, this is a program which can print all the memory that your process is requesting, right? So what I'm, what I'm asking you is, if your program, so it tells you all the memory that you're, not, not this way, but, but it's asking what exact addresses you're requesting, right? So I'm asking you to come up with a simulator to see if that was a request, if that, if that particular program is the one that is giving you a bread and butter program, right? How do these policies behave, right? So that program is pretty nice because it tells you all the logical addresses that your program uh, accesses. And you can use that to analyze different policies, right? So we'll, we'll analyze different policies, but, but the nice thing is you can run PIN on any program you can think of, right? You can run it on LS, you can run it on the simulator itself, right? To see what is a good policy, right? And of course, a company like Microsoft does this day in and day out because they want to see how these things are, because they want to modify some policy, see how it behaves, and then collect new traces and, and go on and you know go back and forth. And we'll see a little bit of that for the homework project, right? So I want you to look at the homework project with that sense, because you're first trying to get how memory access is done by a typical program and see how one of these policies will behave. It might behave good or behave bad, but that's that's what we're trying to do, right? So again, I, you know, like from, just like I said in the module one, and, and I'm going to say in module three and module four, from operating system perspective, there is no right answer or not wrong answer, right? Best fit or worst fit or first fit or what have you. You can come up with any number of policies. You can come up with random fit or whatever, right? Essentially, it all depends on how the, uh, the things, it depends on the application and one or the other may work out. And, uh, you know, after a lot of analysis, you come up with certain Things, things saying like, you know, this particular allocation does not work at all. So, anyway, so going, getting back to the technologies, what happens with all this, with the notion of uh, what we're looking at is a, is a concept called fragmentation, right? Fragmentation is the chunk of memory which is not useful to anybody, right? The idea ha has two different variants. One is external fragmentation, one is internal fragmentation. The idea here is, suppose we, we followed Adam's uh, policy, right, which is the best fit, right? In the example we talked about, that you, know, you have like a 10 units free, right? And suppose if most of the, if no application requests less than 20, right? That means you've now created this 20, 10 chunk of memory, which no one can possibly use because everybody requests at least 20. So now we created this, this fragment, which is not useful to anybody, right? So you gave the process what it wanted, but you created this external fragment which is not useful to anybody, right? So you'll have to worry about external fragmentation, right? The internal fragmentation comes where I say I only give stuff in chunks of, let's say, 100. So if you ask for 110, I'm going to give you 100, 200 anyway because I'm only going to give in multiples of 100, right? And we'll, we'll see why, in the next lecture, why you would want to do the other way because it's, it's, it makes your life a little simpler, right? So depending on which allocation policy you use, you will either have internal fragmentation or external fragmentation. Internal fragmentation where IS operating system give you some memory which you didn't ask for, which you're not gonna use, right? But because of the way I, I, I do stuff, I'll have a fragmentation. External fragmentation is a, is a policy because, because of what I did, I created some chunk of memory which can be used by nobody, right? Because I, I, can, I just can't do anything. Because in, in this case, I, I created a whole of, of 10 uh, blocks which cannot be allocated to anybody because people only ask 20, right? So this is a problem which, which defines what kind of policies we're gonna, run, we're gonna create in the next few, um, um, uh, in the next lecture, right? It has, um, this has a lot of significance on how you do the swapping, how you do the allocation, all those things, right? Um, and we'll leave it at, at, at that, and we'll continue with the, with the, after the spring break. Hope you guys have a um, good, good break, right? I'll be here, so if you, any of you are working on homework projects or whatever over the break, send me chat or email or whatever. <laughs>